Amen, guys. Thank you very much. Hey, grab your Bibles, fire up your devices. Daniel chapter 5. Notes are in the center of the bulletin as always. You can also fire up that app and use them that way if you'd like. Here we are, Daniel 5, the handwriting is on the wall. That's one of those great idiomatic phrases that you say every once in a while. You know, it was last summer that I had to take my, my car in to the, uh, to the mechanic. It was, it was making a horrendous noise when you reached highway speeds. And the steering wheel would shake. And so, uh, I, you know, being a, an astute uh, ind- individual of engineering feats, I knew the writing is on the wall, something is wrong with my car. And so I took it in and uh, the mechanic said, well, yeah, you've got some serious problems with uh, these like mechanical issues over here. And he goes, how long has this been going on? I said, well, not a long time, uh, at least at, at the rate it is and the noise it's making now, but it's probably been making a noise for six or eight months. And he used the phrase, that's when you should have read the writing on the wall. Your car was messed up and, well, it's going to cost you more because you waited. Uh, but you get it, the handwriting on the wall. We've all used that phrase many, many times, haven't we? I mean, the, the phrase that comes from this very passage and all students of the Bible can look around our world and we can see the handwriting on the wall. We can see the signs of the times. It's unfolding uh, right before our very eyes. We're seeing uh, the scriptures, well, just at work right here in front of us. As sin begins to take a, uh, a greater hold upon creation, and we begin to see the things of the Bible, well, that are good and holy and righteous called wicked, and the things of the world that are wicked are called good, well, we can see the writing on the wall of the signs of the times. You know, people are looking for answers in chaos. People are looking for answers. If you look at the studies, I just read the report coming out from Barna when it comes to our our zennials, those that are in high school and right out of high school, they are looking for answers. And they're looking towards the spiritual. And sadly, my friends, there's a whole lot of spiritual nonsense out there ready to give them answers. And that's why we as the church must be ready and equipped and willing to help answer those questions. People are looking for answers as they too see the writing on the wall. Did you know that suicide rates are up? Nearly triple in young girls. Think about that. Nearly triple in young girls, 11 to 18, suicide is up nearly three times. Last year, reporting was 2019, there was 1.38 million suicide attempts. People are looking for answers in this world. So we look and we see what's taking place around us. Our so-called professionals now, well, they don't believe that they can determine the sex of a child at birth. The writing is on the wall. When we're seeing individuals look at the good deeds of the church of the Lord Jesus and say, those people are living by an antiquated book and they are harmful to society, the writing is on the wall. And so what is the point? Look at your notes here. The need for our day, the only hope for our world is Jesus. We need a spiritual awakening. The only hope for our world is the Lord Jesus, and we need a spiritual awakening. But here's the thing, my friends. We'll never have a spiritual awakening until we are awakened in our own souls, in our own hearts, and in our own minds, until you and I put away the things of the flesh and live out the life of a disciple, of denying self, obeying the scriptures, and following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, you and I need to wake up. You and I need an awakening before we can ever see any sort of awakening across, well, the church and the community and the nation and the world. It begins right here at home. It begins in my own heart. Take a second. Think about your life, your holiness factor. What's the writing on the wall? What's the writing on the wall? Daniel 5 tells us the writing is on the wall. It's the story of the young king Belshazzar. He was put on the Lord's scales of justice and he was found deficient. Although Grandpa Nebuchadnezzar got saved, we saw that a few weeks ago, godliness was not passed down to the generations. This, my friends, 
We see in, well, 3D right here in the scriptures in real life, a saved grandfather by the time it gets to the grandson is far from God. This is why it's so crucial for us to pour in to the next generation. This is why we invest so heavily our time and energy in finances in the next generation because we must pass down the faith to our boys and our girls, to our young men and our young women. This is why we do things like D-Now next week. We want to equip them to understand the things of the faith in relation to our culture because, again, the culture is trying and will well, perfect them in its image unless we fight against it. Amen? Unless we give them a better image, and we have one called Jesus. It's up to us. You know, next week we're bringing in one of the best speakers available Not just for students, but available to the church when it comes to these issues. We're bringing him in to speak four or five or six sessions to our students in D-Now. He's so good, we're keeping him over for Sunday morning because we want them to know Christ. We want them to be able to defend their faith. We want them to be able to proclaim their faith. We want them to be able to own their faith as their own. Oh, friends, the writing is on the wall. How will we respond? I pray we respond differently than Belshazzar. I pray we respond as born-again, spirit-filled followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's dig into the passage, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Stand in honor of reading the Word of God. We're in Daniel 5. So much good going on here. So much to learn. So much to glean. The Holy Scriptures say, Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousands. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone." Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then, he, then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hip joints were, went slack. His knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans and the diviners The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler and his nobles were perplexed. Verse 10. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, Your father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because of an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanations of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. 
O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne, and his glory was taken away from him. He was driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of beasts, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now, this is the inscription that was written out. Mine, mine, tekel, upfarsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Mine, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have weighed on the scales and found deficient Perez. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave orders and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night... Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about age of 62. Father, bless the reading of your word. May we understand this narrative. Not simply to be a historic uh, happening in our world, but to be the truths of scripture that you've laid out for us as a reminder and a remembrance of, well, truths that we can learn from you. So Lord, give us ears to hear. Give us minds to think and to understand that we might be conformed into your image. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So after the death of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian Empire began to deteriorate. We knew this was going to happen. Daniel prophesied this years earlier. And so the spiritual lessons that Nebuchadnezzar had learned while king were generally forgotten by the monarchs that followed him. Consequently, the stage that was set for Babylonia to be taken over, to be conquered by an inferior nation, and it would happen just as the Lord said, just as Daniel predicted many years earlier. Now, this chapter, chapter 5, records the fall of Babylon and the death of her final king, Belshazzar. What we're going to discover in uh, this text over the next few moments together that the Babylonians' pride and arrogance led to the defeat of this mighty kingdom, this powerful kingdom, and its seemingly impenetrable capital, Babylon. And we're going to find this ancient, ancient historic account has some timely lessons to teach you and I about the justice and sovereignty of the Lord God and the power of one godly life. One life lived for him. Now, before we get in, I want to give you a bit of biblical context so you can understand what's happening here, and you can begin to place this in, well, history and understand the flow of the narrative. So look at your notes there, the biblical context. King Nebuchadnezzar ruled until his death in 562 B.C. So King Nebuchadnezzar ruled until 562 B.C., then his, uh, his son, Evil Merodach, how would you like to have that name, by the way, Evil Merodach? Here comes old King Evil Merodach. The king's son, well, he ruled for two years. He ruled for two years. Now, before his death, Evil Merodach released the Jewish ruler, Jehoiakim, and gave him a place of honor in the Babylonian royal court. Now, this is important for a few reasons that we're going to need to understand. And so look at 2 Kings. If you've got your Bible, you want to flip over there quickly, or you can read it on the screen here. Uh, but look to the scriptures, my friends. I hope you bring a Bible, whether it's electronic or it's a, uh, a bound Bible, because we want to study them. We want to be a, a good Berean. We want to test everything according to the scriptures. 2 Kings 25, 
27 through 30. Now it came about in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he became king, released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison, and he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the, two, of the kings who were with him in Babylon. Jehoiakim changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. So what happens next? In 560 BC, evil Merodach was assassinated by his brother-in-law, Neraglissar. Now think about the family dynamics when your brother-in-law has assassinated you. Can you imagine when King Nebuchadnezzar was on the throne, he ruled this place with an iron fist. It had peace and serenity. It had uh, wealth and power that no one would touch, no one would speak against. And now at his death, things begin to deteriorate so much that there is murder within the royal family. And then what do we see? Look at that next fill in the blank there. Neraglissar's son ruled for nine months, nine months before his n- murder and Nabonidus took the throne. So again, look at this. More murder, more subterfuge, more sin. The kingdom is deteriorating. What happens when a nation has chaos at the helm, eventually it falls. I think we can apply some modern day principles to the biblical text, amen? And then what do we see next? Nabonidus and Belshazzar ruled as co-regents. Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And so have all this in mind. So now you have Nabonidus and Belshazzar, their co-regents. This is why he promises Daniel to be the authority of the third ruler in the kingdom because it's, well, Nabonidus, Belshazzar, then it would be Daniel. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from what's happening here? Look at your notes there. A love for the Lord isn't automatically passed down from one generation to the next. We need to understand this. We need to get this. I believe every one of us, anecdotally, we get this truth. We understand that just because we are believers that our our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren will not automatically follow Christ. It's why it's so crucially important for us to put his attributes on display for the next generation so that the most probable outcome would be that they would know, love, and serve the Lord. This is why we must talk about him often. This is why the local gathering of the church is so crucial. The church is his bride for crying out loud. If you love the Lord, you'll love his church. That's why it's crucial to have our kids in church. Again, do you see how important it is to pass down our faith? By the time it gets to Belshazzar, the chaos reigns because of sin. Hey, what are you doing to see this happen in your own life? What are you doing to see the faith that you have passed down to the next generation? What's your discipleship plan in your own family for, for your children or your grandchildren? You say, well, well, pastor, I didn't do a good job. My kids are grown. You can always start today. Maybe it looks a bit different. Maybe it's simply texting some encouraging verses or letting them know they're praying, you're praying for them. Get creative. Talk to the Lord about it. But what are you doing? What are you doing to pass down the faith to the next generation in our church? Did you guys know that on a normal Sunday... of our church is under the age of 18. Uh, You know, that's one of the the reasons I love to hear little babies crying. I don't know, last week we had like three or four babies in every service. They just cry. I loved it. It means our church is alive. It means there's life in the pews. It means we need to be on mission to take our faith in the lives of boys and girls and young men and young women, what are you doing to pour your life into the young people of our church? Look at that next fill in the blank there. What do we learn? Belshazzar went out of his way to mock the Lord God. Did you pick up on what was happening here? The biblical account has him going so far out of his way to mock the Lord. He he went out of his way to, to shake his fist and defy the Lord God of Israel, the creator of heaven and earth, his creator. Did you see it there in verse two? Look at it. Look at what he does. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, 
He gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the kings and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Belshazzar, perhaps in a drunken state in this massive party, says, bring all of the, 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 the temple dishware out that we took from Jerusalem and let's mock God by drinking from them and praising the individual, well, elements that each cup is made from. This was complete mockery of the Lord God. Belshazzar was so out of touch for so many reasons. Belshazzar would be what we call today not being self-aware. Self-awareness is a big deal. And old Belshazzar had none of it. So what do we need to learn? Look at your notes there. Self-awareness is one of the great gifts of knowing Christ. As we uh, become self-aware, knowing the Lord, one of the benefits of knowing Christ is having a better understanding of who we are and, and our giftings. How about you? Are you self-aware? Do you know yourself? Would those closest to you have the same opinions of yourself as you do? I mean, I think most of us say, yeah, man, I know me. I look in the mirror and I'm my favorite person. I know me. I'd argue, do you really know yourself? There's a famous quote by the great philosopher Socrates. It says, man, know thyself. You've seen that on T-shirts. Have you seen it on a meme on social media? I don't believe we can ever really know ourselves until we know the one who created us and knows us best. This is why we have our growth steps. Step two coming up next week is all about discovering God's purpose for your life. Really, that class could probably be better said is get to know him. And as you get to know him, you'll get to know you. And then you'll know your purpose for your life. But that doesn't fit on a pithy little, well, graphic we can put on social media or an email. So the class is step two, discovering God's purpose. It truly is a benefit of being a believer, just like being a benefit of a believer is forgiveness and grace and mercy and purpose and eternal life. Another benefit of the believer is being self-aware. The Lord, listen to this. Do you understand this truth? The Lord wants you to take advantage of this life. The Lord wants you to live on purpose and for great purpose in this life, in your 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this earth. He wants you to take full advantage of it and live on purpose and for great purpose because, well, look at that next fill in the blank. What you do on this side of the grave affects what happens on the other side of the grave. First, all of us are going to live somewhere forever in one of two places. Either a very real place called heaven or a very real place called hell. For those of us that are saved, we put our faith alone in Christ alone for the forgiveness of our sins, for, well, a purpose-filled life now and eternal life forever. We will enter into his presence and be with him forever and ever and ever. Those that, well, they live for self, the non-saved, those who have rejected the free gift of salvation, those who have rejected Christ's gift, they're going to stand before the Lord for a brief moment. Their name's not going to be mentioned in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he's going to say, depart from me, I do not know you, and they'll be in a place called hell forever. Also for the believer, depending on how you live this life in accordance to the Word of God, depends on the eternal rewards that you'll receive then. Listen, I said all the time, obedience brings reward. It brings reward in this life, and it will for sure bring reward in the next life. Are you self-aware enough to understand that? Or are you going through life with oblivion? You see, I think so many people are going through life just getting up, working, trying to accumulate some stuff, trying to make themselves happy, that it's over. Some are believers and some aren't, but they never truly lived. And the Lord wants us to live. He wants to give us the abundant life. 
You can only truly live when you plug in to Christ and live out your gifts in obedience to him. Look at that next fill in the blank. As we walk with the Lord, we become self-aware. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. But as we walk with him, as we, as we talk with him, as we, we pray with him, as we worship him, as we uh, get to know him through the scriptures, as we do life with other believers, as iron sharpens iron, we, well, become more and more self-aware. There's a famous quote that, uh, depending on where you read, it can come from uh, one of the great Greek philosophers, which probably it does, but uh, I, I read it with Frederick Hegel. What we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. That's what we learn. We just keep repeating our bad mistakes over and over and over and over again. And I want to show you what happens. I want to show you what happens when someone doesn't know themselves, when they're not self-aware. I want to show you what that kind of person does when they also don't learn from history. And so this is an account in Daniel chapter 5 of someone who is not reading the handwriting on the wall. They've been hearing their their car screech and make funny noises for six, eight, nine months, and they did nothing about it. So what's going to happen here? Toward the end of the co-regency of Nabonidus and Belshazzar, the Medo-Persian military led by Cyrus marched to Babylon. This army was, was met by Nabonidus and the Babylonian troops at Opus, there north of the Tigris River, uh, north of the city of Babylon. So Nabonidus, the, uh, the, the co-regent and the military of Babylon, they're standing there. The Medes and the, per- the Persian military is with them. And Nabonidus suffers significant loss. He, he suffers a, a massive whipping, you could say. And he retreats to the south. He leaves the city of Babylon completely exposed now. Now it is Cyrus and his military and no one in between him and the great city of Babylon. He's taken off. Now the defeat wasn't taken very seriously by Belshazzar. I mean, understand a little bit about the city of Babylon. They had enough provisions in this massive city for a multi-year siege. They could wait out any army. Uh, they, uh, besides the magnificent fortifications of the city of Babylon, made the city safe. Do you recall the walls? 320 feet high, 80 some odd feet wide. There was about a hundred towers all the way around the walls, which would give the military of the Babylonians just a a wonderful spot just to pick people off as they come up to the the wall. And don't forget the magnitude of this city. The city of Babylon was 3,200 acres. That's huge. That's massive. And it was surrounded by this moat and this massive wall. And so Belshazzar is like, bring it on, Medes and Persians. No big deal for us. Do you know who we are? We are the Babylonians. We are the, the sons and daughters of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so he doesn't take the threat seriously. It seems, honestly, that the Medes and Persians, Osiris, has a hollow victory. Oh, so he ran Nabonidus out. Big deal. Little bit did Belshazzar know that this, despite the city's fortifications, his rule was about to come to an end. And so what does this king with little emotional IQ do? What does this king who has little self-awareness do in the, the face of, well, a battle coming to his front door? He throws a party. He's like, it's Sunday, 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 party, party, party. It's right there in verse 1. Look at it. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. Look at that. There was a party. Mocking the Lord using the the holy uh, temple dishes, so to speak. 
Now understand something pretty cool. This is really pretty fascinating, honestly. So he's throwing a party for a thousand people. Now archaeologists have found, and by the way, every time archaeology digs something up, it always proves the Bible true. Always proves the Bible true. Even if there's a hint of like, well, I don't know about this. Later on, they dig something up that answers that question that proves the Bible true. Take it to the bank every time. So here's what archaeology has found. So remember I told you a few weeks ago, the great uh, river Euphrates runs right through the city of Babylon. And this is cool. The city is kind of broken into, I guess you say, east and west. You know, not like east and west St. Louis. I mean, it's like east and west Babylon. It's like legit, right? And so underneath the river, archaeologists have found a massive banquet room that would easily seat 1,000 revelers that connects both sides of the city. Most biblical scholars believe this room that has been found is the very room that Belshazzar throws his party in uh, there as, well, uh, the Medes and Persians are marching down from the north to take control of the great city of Babylon. So they're in this like underground bunker behind these 320 foot walls, 80 some odd feet thick with the greatest military on the face of the planet. And he's like, what's the big deal? Throw a party and let's defame the Lord God of Israel while we're at it. Another cool fact is in this room, they have found piles and piles of plaster that used to cover the entire walls and ceiling of this great room. Isn't that fascinating? The very hand of God touched some of that plaster. It's the very room that this took place in right here that we're talking about. And so Belshazzar is throwing a party in honor of the gods, and he's making fun of the God of Israel. Guess what's about to happen? The Lord God's going to crash a party. Man, I don't know if you've ever crashed a party or not. This is like the triumph of all crashing the parties. Look at it in verse 5. Check this out. So you know what's going on. Suddenly the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. So he sees the back of the hand. Nothing else. That will freak you out. So a drunken Belshazzar stares at the words the hand is writing as it's being written. And look at verse 6. Then the king's face grew pale and his thoughts alarmed him and his hips joints went slack and his knees began knocking together. I don't know about you, but I just picture, you know, Scooby and Shaggy or something. You know, there's a, you know, I just kind of picture that in my mind. The knees are knocking. This terrifying scene must have caused the musicians to put aside their instruments, the dancing girls to go motionless, the waiters to stop in their tracks, and every guest to freeze in fear. Look at verse 7. Look at it with me. Do you see it? The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. Isn't it just like us? At the first hint of trouble, we want to try to fix it in our own power. Why can't we simply just go to God when we need help? It's like that song says, the battle belongs to the Lord, and I'll fight my battle on my knees. I was talking to a couple of elementary students about that song, and they're like, what what does that mean? It means you pray, just in case that you miss that. We fight our battles as believers on our knees. So he calls in the wise men, and they can't interpret anything. Big shock. This has already happened many times. And so this causes more alarm. Look at verse 9 now. Look at verse 9. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler and his nobles were perplexed. Now, check out this. This is pretty cool. After learning of the incident, the queen, who more than likely was Belshazzar's mom, the daughter of King Nebuchadnezzar, she enters into the hall and she tells her son, hey, I know a guy. Look at it in verse 10. Look what the queen says. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, oh, king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. She goes on to recount how Daniel spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar. 
So apparently, at this point, Daniel was about 80 years old. He was in semi-retirement. And it very well could be due to poor health. If you flip over to Daniel chapter 8, verse 27, it says, Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there's none to explain it. And so this would explain if he was in his 80s and he was sick and he's in retirement, why he wasn't at the feast as, as well as why he wasn't known by Belshazzar. Did you pick up on that, that Belshazzar didn't know who he was? Did you notice that as we read? Belshazzar was like, uh, who are you? What, what, what's going on here? Look at verse 13. Look at it. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who was one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now, now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. He's like, I don't even know who you are, but I hear good things. <laughs> Not everyone had forgotten Daniel. Did you see how the queen speaks of him? Just go back one verse to verse 12. Do you see what she says? This is the queen. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel. It appears that Daniel's godly lifestyle had remained untainted by the heathen culture of the Babylonians. And so as a result, he stood out. And so the queen says, this is who helped your grandfather. I believe he can help you. And so Belshazzar does what any man-centered, selfish individual does. He tries to buy him. Did you pick up on that in verse 16? If you'll just do this for me, I'll give you purple and I'll give you gold and I'll make you the third ruler in all the kingdom. But Daniel couldn't be bought. He's a man of God. You see what he says in verse 17? Keep your stuff. Keep it. Daniel refused to be a man pleaser. Instead, he chose to remain faithful to the Lord God. I love what Paul says in Galatians 1.10, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. That typifies Daniel. Now, before Daniel reveals the message that was on the wall, he reviews some history with Belshazzar. Did, did you notice there in uh, 18, 19, 20, he's recounting the, the story of King Nebuchadnezzar? Did you, did you see that there? Did you pick up on that? He says, this is who your, who your grandfather was. He was the most powerful, magnificent king on the planet, all because of the grace and mercy and goodness of the Lord God. But he got arrogant, he got prideful, and the Lord, well, took him down a notch or two. Remember, pride comes before the fall. He recalls that Belshazzar's grandfather had become so proud and arrogant. Did you see that in verse 20? And then after this little review, Daniel cuts to the chase. You know, the prophet of God always cuts to the chase. And when he cuts to the chase, well, his words hurt. But it's always in a compassionate confrontation. He's always saying it as the spokesman of God to give the person a, 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 perhaps a reprieve to get grace. And look at it in 22. Look at it in 22. Look what's going on here. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life, breath, and all your ways, you have not glorified. There it was. Daniel said it like it was. Daniel finally said it. And the mysterious writing was God's words of judgment on the prideful king. So Belshazzar probably knew this from the beginning what it was. And Daniel simply confirms it. And then Daniel wastes no time in the interpretation. Mine, mine, take ufarsin, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and he's put it to an end. It's over. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Jeremiah 27. Command them to go to their masters, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the men, and the beasts which are on the face of the earth by my great power 
and by my outstretched arm. And I will give it to the, to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings will make him their servant. Jeremiah was fulfilled on this day. After Daniel delivered the message of judgment, Belshazzar promoted him as promised, but that was a very short little victory for Daniel. Under the leadership of Cyrus, under his resourceful commander, Ugbaru, the Medes and Persian military conquered Babylon. So two messages you and I can apply from this message today. You ready for them? Number one, God's judgment may seem slow, but it's thorough. God's judgment may seem slow, but it's thorough. Belshazzar's wicked rule was allowed to continue for several years before God brought it to an end. Why? Because God is grace-giving. He, he gave Belshazzar every opportunity to turn from his gods and commit his life to the Lord. But when Belshazzar tried to set himself up higher than God, when he, he mocked God by using the holy utensils to, to worship the, the false gods of, uh, well, the elements, well, that was enough. He was deposed. He was killed. This highlights that although the Lord God is patient, he will not withhold judgment forever. As we look around our world, we need to understand this truth. It may look like wicked is winning. In the end, God will make all things right. 2 Peter 3, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the wor world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape, you, escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance." Listen, don't take his compassion for granted by living a life for self. One day judgment will come and you'll stand before the Lord. Number two, a second lesson we can learn from this message. You should never underestimate the power of one godly life. You should never underestimate the power of one godly life. Daniel's highly respected reputation as a man of God persisted in a climate of idolatry and immorality and treason. What an example that is to us. We're living in days of great compromise. Just heard this week again another well-known, famed researcher and writer for Desiring God Ministries has left the faith. Oh, my friends. The power of one godly life who stands for the Lord to the very end. Because of this believer's faithfulness, the Lord was able to use him mightily to influence and confront these pagan rulers. The Lord wants to use you in a similar manner. But you must be committed to him regardless of the cost. Will you stand for truth? Will you stand for the faith? Will you stand for, well, uh, the integrity of the scriptures? Even when it costs, are you willing to be a spokesperson? Then submit yourself completely to him and obey him unreservedly. Never underestimate the power of one godly life. I mean, think about that in your own life. Who in your life stands out as an example of a godly life? Think about the impact of that one person on you. Maybe sometime this week, reach out to them and let them know what an encouragement that would be. And let me ask you another question as Sean comes to play. Is your life a godly example to follow? If our students, young people were to follow you around and live as you live, act as you act, talk as you talk, do what you do, would they grow up knowing, loving, and serving the Lord? Is your life an example 
of godliness? Think on that for a moment. What's the Spirit of God saying to you? Would you bow with me for just a moment here? If you're a believer in this room or streaming online, what is your life advertising? Is it advertising the love of Jesus Christ, the truth of the Word of God, or a man-centered lifestyle? Deal with the Lord. Ask Him to give you the strength on the inside to live holy and godly, that you might be, well, a godly influence in the life of someone else. Maybe you're here this morning and you've seen the handwriting on the wall. The Lord's been speaking to you. He's been revealing himself to you. And it's time for you to bow the knee, to put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Here's what I want you to know. The Lord loves you. He loves you so much, in fact, that he sent his one and only son to this earth to live a sinless life, to be an example for us all, to go to the cross, to shed his blood, to give his body a sacrifice, to die, to be buried, And on the third day, he rose again, proving he is who he says he is, proving he can do what he says he can do. And the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then Paul goes on to say in Romans 10, 13, that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Is today the day of salvation for you? If it is, would you just pray this prayer? Just simply a prayer of faith, maybe in your own words or something like this. Just say, dear Jesus, I believe. I believe you are who you say you are. And I I ask you to come into my life as Lord and God to save me from my sins, to help me live a life of purpose and meaning. I repent from my old way and I begin to live according to your way. Help me now in Jesus' name. We're going to stand and sing. And if you have prayers or have questions, I'll be right here. Will you stand with me? Well, church family, thank you so much again for joining us here at FC at Home. What uh, an amazing day of worship and celebrating what God has done in us and through us and reminding us, Pastor, of what it looks like to live a godly life and the effects that has on the world around mm-hmm. us. You know, I, I wonder if you just speak uh, a little bit more about, you know, the, the power of that and maybe give an encouragement to the folks at home, uh, to those people who've been an influence in them, in their lives. Yeah, you know, you're right, man. The power of a godly life is, is immense. And sometimes it comes in little small investments, these little ripples that aren't flashy or showy, but they make a difference over the long haul. I think of the dozens and dozens of marriages within our own church families that have lived a Christ-honoring life and marriage and the way they've raised their kids that simply from, well, afar and and up close, they've made a difference in my life. Uh, The ripple effect they've had across our church. And and so who is that in your life? Who is the specific person or, or people who have had an impact on you because they've had a faithful godly uh, life that simply, well, puts the attributes of the Lord on display for you to see. Man, reach out to them and encourage them. Send them an email, a text message, write them a handwritten card, uh, take them out to lunch and simply say, I wanted to say thank you for your investment in me by the way you've lived your life. Uh, Just a simple encouragement. So Pastor Sean, why don't you pray, one, that we would be a people who uh, lives a life of example for others, and then pray that we would reach out and encourage those that have been for us. Yeah, absolutely. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship today. And Lord, we do. We pray that you would give us the muscles on the inside to live a godly life. Your word says that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. Mm -hmm. And Lord, help us to access that power uh, to be an example for others of what it looks like to live in obedience. And God, I pray uh, a a prayer of thanks Mm -hmm. for those who've been that example to us, that Mm -hmm. those people to look to uh, from Scripture and in our own lives uh, that lived uh, holy, blameless, godly Mm -hmm. lives that we can be uh, uh, looked to as an example and Mm -hmm. emulate. And Lord, I pray that we would be bold to reach out to them and to say thank you. And and Lord, just encourage them to continue uh, in the race, in the faith race of godliness. And so, Lord, uh, go with us this week. Empower us with with your spirit, God, to live for the good of the community, the glory of Christ, and the salvation of all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.